Hello, good afternoon. So we're back for part two of the discussion and Cameron was sharing a story with us about empires in the pre-modern world and you mentioned Rome. So you ended the previous discussion by talking about Rome. You may continue. Yeah, um, and sorry I about wrapped up there, but the point was that, um, that empires are not really on the ground domination from a political center. In fact, there's very little of that in what in any historical empire. That this that actual empires were mostly just co-opting and integrating people into a client network. I, I'm I'm super interested in empire because of the quality of empirical research and primary sources. We don't have to speculate any more. And there have been seen really interesting studies on the legacies of empires everywhere, both colonial and non-colonial empire. Just recently, I saw a paper on the legacies of the Ottoman Empire. I'm yet to read it, but it's a new paper. Maybe it was published last year or the year before. And the scholars keep churning out papers on legacies of European empires, particularly the British Empire. So that's a question. I find interesting how empires shape future development. Surprisingly, not all studies are negative. Empires do have some long-run positive effects. So there's a paper titled Imperial Capital, asserting that some of the effects of imperialism on the economy are positive because they lead to better trade and trade routes, et cetera. So I'm not in favor of empires. I think they're costly, but they can be beneficial. Yeah, and the basic question, and I don't actually know the answer to this question, is to what extent do empires leave a legacy of, more, of the kind of moral change that we were talking about? And there's examples where they've done this and examples where they have not, right? And one of the, uh, I, I think the failure of empire, and you can think of the British empire as kind of this transitional empire between traditional empire and more bureaucratic on the ground management. There's some places where the British empire left a legacy of uh, impartial justice uh, generalized morality in some places where it didn't. I was having a discussion the other day thinking about um, Botswana, which is a relatively re relatively successful sub-Saharan African country, and wondering what's different about Botswana than a lot of the surrounding places. And one of the answers uh, that came in was that Botswana before the colonial era had a long standing monarchy and this monarchy was already friendly to the uh to british norms in fact one uh one king uh attempted to join the british empire and then the the one after him actually backed out of that so what you see in botswana is a long history of friendliness to these kinds of norms that are conducive to economic growth and this seems to be this seems to work out for them despite a lot of factors that you might think would would set them back one of the most important ones being uh, a very very concentrated natural resource sector which tends to be very bad for institutions Botswana's managed this relatively well considering right uh, and I think that has to do with the the fact that people there have been more receptive to kind of these fundamental British style moral norms than a lot of other places that we think of as development failures. And you're this academic of African descent. His father was born in Africa. He studied abroad. I don't remember if this academic was born in Africa, but he lived in Africa for a time. He has a new book out on colonialism. It's super interesting. I will read it and maybe write a review. And he's, ba he's basically arguing 
even though he's a critic of colonialism, he's arguing that some places considered to be failures are actually success because the British succeeded in supplanting tribal tendencies. And mm -hmm. when the British succeeded on that level, governance was improved. So that yeah. is argument. And J J Jamaica is an upper middle income country. It is, it is not a success story relative to Botswana, Barbados, or Singapore, but it's a livable country. As I said, it's upper middle income. It does well on social indicators. The life expectancy reflects that of a developing country, although it's corrupt and antisocial. So it's a paradox, but it does better than other places. And he's saying that one of the reasons for this relative success is that the British had, a, had time to modernize Jamaica. So I think it's going to be an interesting read. I, I would buy that argument. And yes. here, here's another question that I don't have a good answer for. When you blow up a bad institution, when does that result in better institutions versus worse institutions? So let me give you an example. You've seen, see, you know, we you talked about some of this research on uh, colonial legacies. Uh, for example, um, I'm sure you know Asimoglu and Robinson and their work on French versus English colonial institutions. Now, in their work, the French institutions are the bad ones, right? Now, when do we see modern economic growth start in Germany? It's when Napoleon invades and imposes the Napoleonic code on all these little German fiefdoms. And all of a sudden you blow up all these bad institutions and suddenly modern economic growth takes over. I've even heard an argument and I don't know if I buy this or not, but I, I can understand the logic. The argument was that the Soviet Union was actually an improvement and pro-growth, not because the Soviet Union was good, but because the uh, the institutions under the Tsar were so bad that just blowing that up got you really far. On the other hand, there's a lot of stories in development economics about people trying to disrupt tribal institutions in places in Africa. And instead of modern growth taking over, what we see is just a lot of dysfunction, tribal fighting, and there's not that... Uh, you don't get the bump to better institutions, you just get replaced with something worse. And so the question, which I think is an open question is, when is institutional destruction, when should we expect institutional destruction to be good versus bad? It has to be legitimate. Mm -hmm. State legitimacy, people must repose confidence in these reforms. So again, another example from Jamaica. So Jamaica went back to the IMF over 10 years ago. And so far, the program has been a success. The Economist magazine, the Financial Times, many prominent outlets are praising Jamaica. Mm -hmm. What was different? What was what 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 happened differently? If from the, the big difference between this agreement and previous agreements is that this agreement interestingly had a program called EPOC, Economic Production Oversight Committee. So when that program was first launched, I was not particularly impressed because Jamaica is obsessed with committees and bureaucracies. It's a pretext for getting nothing done. But surprisingly, this epoch was rather productive and it imposed standards on the government. It followed reforms, monitored them, shared reforms with the media and with the public, had the community discussions, and that helped to foster legitimacy for the IMF program. And it has been successful. Well, what was different this time? Did that, 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 that's not... what I said. The EPOC, so Economic Production Oversight Committee, that's a group of people who are responsible for monitoring the IMF program. So it was, so was basically there their no job. Such group? Yes. Was there no such group before? No, no, no. So this has never occurred on an IMF okay. program before. So some people in civil society said, J 
Jamaica cannot fail again. And they basically coerce the government into performing. So they monitored the government. They had press, press briefings. They went into communities. They write notes. They collaborated with the IMF. So they were basically the, the teacher telling the government to perform. And they went into communities so people were educated. The GDP, GDP became a popular term. The, the debt to the GDP ratio, interest payments, those were household terms. And the program was a big deal. So it was an it was a PR program essentially, mm -hmm. but it was successful. So usually the typical yeah. man on the street wouldn't care about positive and negative externalities and GDP and interest payments, but that program propagated the message of the IMF. They went into communities, especially the poor communities, and they were monitoring the program. The government was like being graded. And society. now these people have it. Now these people are invested in making sure this succeeds. Exactly. So the program developed legitimacy because of the epoch. Hmm. Interesting. Yes, and it so has I never happened before. It has never is. happened before. But yes, yeah, civil society decided that the program could not fail this time. And they basically became the school principal. And look, it surprisingly, surprisingly, the program worked. Yeah, and I, I think you're absolutely right that that buy-in has to be there. Yes. And then I guess the question is, is that a random process? Where where does that buy-in come from? So, what exactly do you mean? The, the Who comprised the council or who supported well, because the reforms? You, you, you mentioned that when you first saw the plan, you were skeptical that it would yes. work because yeah. bureaucracy, as you say, in yes. such a place is a pretext for getting nothing done. So clearly it's not enough that there just be some bureaucracy to do this. Yeah. It has to be an effective bureaucracy yes. that is actually willing to stand up and stand outside of these traditional client networks. And monitor the program. So monitoring was important. Producing mm -hmm. notes, meetings with the media, with civil society, with ordinary Jamaicans. Monitoring was super important. So it's easy to create a program and then go and sleep. <laughs> but they were always in the news. Yeah. So yeah. They, they were they were like the, the politicians. They had to monitor the program. So usually you create a committee and the committee goes to sleep. But this time the committee mm -hmm. was at work. Yeah. And, you know, part of that, I'm sure, is just, you know, people in Jamaica were sick of being yes. again, right? <laughs> yes. yes. So legitimacy is important. You have to cultivate social capital. Yeah. 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 And I wonder how much of that, um, because I I, I'm sure Napoleon didn't spend a whole lot of time cultivating legitimacy <laughs> on the ground when he invaded Germany. But it, it, you, at the same time, you can be efficient without being nice. And so it's curious. Because there, there, are, this new pa there, there are two new papers by Asian researchers studying the redeployment of elite during the Meiji Restoration. So it's not impossible to be efficient mm -hmm. and uncharitable at the same time. It's about the process <laughs> of getting the work done. So the Meiji yeah. Restoration wanted to reform Japan, but they had to reconcile reforms with elite status. The goal was achieved because they found a way to incorporate the elite into the process. So it's not impossible. So you don't have to be a nice guy to build legitimacy. But you yeah. need that you need a strategy. And you I can't guess just this goes back sleep. to your earlier point. Yeah, you, you can't you can't just right. hope and see. And, and yeah, maybe there's multiple ways to get there. Yeah, get mm. into Denmark. It, yeah. Like too many people, too many countries, too many politicians want to grow, but they're not willing to work. They just want to hope and sleep. Hope and sleep, that's when they will they will get up. And right. the country will be Denmark. <laughs> yeah, they, they, they mm -hmm. just want to sleep and hope. And, and it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work. You, you have to build. You can't just sit and sleep. 
you can't just go by, you have to work. <laughs> <laughs> you need a plan. As long as they have a plan, people will follow the plan. So, like, people don't talk much about this, but Lee, I like Lee Kuan Yew, but Lee Kuan Yew was super eccentric. Like, Lee Kuan Yew would, in public, tell men to marry to smart women because intelligence is heritable. <laughs> and people mm. believe them. So, you just need a plan. If you, even the plan isn't palatable, you need a plan. Yeah. Yeah, you know, we we had a discussion. I run a reading group uh yeah. here at uh, here where I work. And we had a discussion about um about oh where where was I going with this? Um I, I kind of lost my train of thought here. Sorry, we were we were talking about um um Institution. Oh, I remember. Is it meaningful to talk about a society having goals other than economic growth? Can a society say we opt out of economic growth? Is it meaningful for them to say that? And I think I think your argument pertains here because the economist would answer this question and say, well, if you give people the ability to opt into economic growth, everybody does that, right? Everybody wants to participate in uh, in the modern economy and get the good stuff. But modern economic growth, and this is what uh, this is the unpopular uh, argument, economic growth, as we've been talking about before, requires these sort of moral orientations, this generalized morality, this um, long-term orientation, among other things. And so is a country or is a society willing to change their norms in order to participate in economic growth? Yes, I asked that question. And it time. looks like the answer has to be no. No, they're not. They're stubborn and stupid. Like, no, <laughs> no, no, but seriously, when you, when you study economic history, it becomes obvious that one of the easiest way to generate growth is to say, do you know what? Maybe my culture is stupid and I need to be like somebody else. Like Japan, at some point you have to say, maybe we're not that great, we need to be like Germany. And too many countries are willing to say we are mediocre. But then the question is, I, 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 don't, I don't know if I'm willing to say stubborn and stupid, because the question is, could somebody rationally say, you know, I love consumer goods, I love economic growth, but I love my own culture too much to adopt <laughs> this generalized morality, long-term orientation, and I'm going to make a conscious decision to reject that, even if that means low economic growth. Could that be a rational decision? No, no, it is only rational if you don't complain. But I don't know if you complain, <laughs> it's irrational. It's just like Africa. Like, the strongest evidence showing, the strongest evidence explaining low economic growth in Africa, other than geography and corruption, is limited time time orientation mm. african businesses are not scaling because of kinship network so somebody is capable he's, he or she starts a business the business is doing well but can the business become google no it is not becoming a google because the entrepreneur has to literally pilfer funds to care for family and friends mm -hmm. so kinship networks are destroying african businesses that's africa's problem low long-term yeah. orientation that's the big problem in africa hmm. yeah and so that that's a i think a useful way to gloss long-term orientation because it's not just you know you have a bunch of people who are intrinsically impatient but you have this norm of familial obligations that eat up any kind of capital that you might want to reinvest like it's just it's like jamaica so people say that jamaicans are entrepreneur but the gm data that data showed that Jamaicans are starting businesses to evade poverty. So they're starting necessity-driven businesses rather than opportunity-driven businesses. And like in Africa, in Jamaica, people pilfer funds to help family members and friends. So they start a business and the business doesn't mm -hmm. scale because they literally eat it out. <laughs> right. And there's a lot of, you know, people talk about, uh, you know, 
up and coming economies. I've seen people point to these entrepreneurship indices and say, you know, um, these very impoverished places in Africa, India are going to be the next economic powerhouses just because the entrepreneurship index is so high. But you're yeah. right that this is not going to, there's no way this can scale given current norms. No, not at all. Like, yeah, his name is Shane, Pro Pro Professor Shane has a paper, Why Encouraging Everybody to Become an Entrepreneur is Bad Policy. Most small businesses fail. So Nesta mm. shows that 6% of small businesses create 50% of employment growth in the UK. So most small businesses fail. They really hustle. They don't scale. So in mm. reality, countries with high rates of entrepreneurship, like places in Africa and Jamaica, are backward. People are starting businesses because the formal economy is not that successful. Mm -hmm. So when I see data saying that India is thriving because of entrepreneurship, I say, no, think about scalability. Where, in, where does venture capital, venture capital scale? In America and other individualistic places. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's about the right way to look at things. Yeah. Like I think well you might you're you're politically correct, maybe. So you're not gonna call people stubborn stubborn and stupid. Maybe David <laughs> maybe David Landeswood or Carlos Cipolla. Well Carlos Cipolla used to call people stupid. <laughs> yeah, no no. Like, uh, I don't know. No no if I want to have legitimacy, I gotta not call people stupid. No, no, no. Nothing entertains <laughs> me more than reading an old economist. <laughs> yeah, you're just like the thing you're stupid you're, you're just stupid <laughs> yeah not, not gonna pull any punches here <laughs> not anymore not not anymore like people don't call people stupid anymore but yeah like if, if you're not a smart person you're just not really smart I, there, there is for sure i mean on the one hand you got to sugarcoat things because you want people to adopt your norms and be legitimate but on the other hand there's something to be said for not sugarcoating things either yeah, like joseph enrich He's a smart mm -hmm. guy and he wrote a brilliant book and people like it. But at the same book, being written by somebody like David Landis, the response would have been super negative. <laughs> I, I can't imagine it. David Landis writes a book like that. I just can't. Right. Uh, yeah, I mean, Henrich is super careful. Yes, he's so, really there's, yeah. politically correct. And, and still, there's people who uh, are that's not good enough for Exactly, like I think Joseph Energy is like one of the nicest academics ever. Like some people would be like, well, clearly based on what I found, you shouldn't expect countries outside of the West other than the East Asian countries to succeed. End of story. Close book. Mm -hmm. So Joseph, like, and we, we can learn a lot from Joseph's book, especially on the importance of markets in promoting morality and scalability. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, I don't think it's a useful exercise to think about, you know, what does he really believe? You know, he's he says what he feels is defensible. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I respect that. Right. <laughs> so, so are you saying that maybe Joe has other thoughts? Oh, uh, it's not for me to speculate. Does money make us moral? Yeah, that's an interesting question, because. The traditional answer to this question has been um, you know, the Marxist answer, or you sometimes go back to uh, Karl Polanyi, who says that, you know, we have this moral economy when people know each other, we have these client networks, everybody feels nice, everybody reciprocates. Um, Polanyi talks about the, uh, the principle of reciprocity being replaced by market logic. And so Marx and Polanyi would say that, you know, money replaces morality and makes us less moral. Uh, even Simmel talks about, um, and, he, and he gets this idea from Marx, he talks about the move from quality into quantity. And I think this is a little more, a little more sophisticated. Uh, he says that in a pre-monetary economy, there's lots of different things we can value. Let's say I value time, I value land, I value, um, you know, resources for children. These are all just different values. They're different things. We can't compare them. And we don't have to compare them because there's no way to exchange these against each other. And Sybil's argument is that when money comes to stand in for universal value, 
all of a sudden we can compare the value of land versus the value of time versus the value of food for your children. And so Marx is going to look at this and say, money is making us less moral. Money is making us uh, more willing to trade off important things and just think of it in a kind of calculating way. And so things that we might have previously regarded as sacred, incommensurable. Now, these are just one value among many, right? And we might be more, more morally lax. And this might be this might tempt us to think of kind of a secularization hypothesis. There are all these things that were important to us. Now they're just one thing among many. But Simmel doesn't go there. Simmel makes, in fact, almost the opposite point. And to understand that, let's go back to thinking about money as money in the division of labor. Because money, because exchange institutions are going to be a key shaping factor in people's morality, in what people regard as moral. Because in order to survive in a collective action context, right, we have to organize the division of labor through these client networks and these larger societies. I got to be committed to my group, right? And the group has to be committed to certain norms that hold the group together and allow the group to solve these problems of accounting and punishment, right? And this has to be legitimate as you, uh, as you talked about before. Now I have another paper called Inside and Outside Perspective, Perspectives on Institutions, where I talk about what these institutions have to look like, what the rules have to look like within these institutions and what they can't look like is super consistent. You got to have a lot of contradictions. You got to have a lot of hypocrisy and corruption and things like that, because otherwise it just doesn't work. There's a great example from Dan Sperber. Um, he talks about the uh, the doors in the doors in Ethiopia, who are traditionally Orthodox mm -hmm. Christians, and he says, um, you know, the doors also believe that leopards are Orthodox Christians. So. Sperber says to them, hey, listen, if the leopards are Orthodox Christians, the leopards ought to observe fast days. And they'll say, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And they'll say, okay, so why are you watching out for leopards on fast days? And they'll say, oh, because leopards are dangerous. He says, but I thought you said leopards were Orthodox Christians. Well, yeah, they are. And, you know, but don't you see the problem? And no, they don't see the problem. So this is kind of a small example of, you know, if you select for consistency, you, you imagine one of these guys saying, oh, yeah, you know, Dan Sperber has kind of a good point here. Uh, and then he doesn't keep watch and then he gets eaten by a leopard. Right? So the general point here is that any, any strictly consistent rule is not going to be incentive compatible in a collective action game. And so no institution, if you are overly consistent, is going to be uh, able to provide for the division of labor and, uh, and for human social organization. So there's always going to be some sort of inconsistency. And what that looks like is, you know, you just cannot have rationalism. You cannot think about, you know, you can't apply uh, rational means ends logic to the moral sphere or else it falls apart. And so think about the Reformation. The Reformation pointed out, look at the Catholic Church. Like, none of this, what we're doing, is consistent with Christian morality. Like, what are we doing here? And this was not a novel point. People had been saying this for hundreds and hundreds of years. And trying to start breakaway sects, and it never really succeeded. Because you look at this and you say, hey, let's be consistent here. And then all of a sudden, you can't provide for your for your group, because you got to run a society that way. And so the Catholic Church was geared not toward a consistent morality, but toward running a society and organizing the division of labor. All of a sudden, and this is where Simmel's point comes in, now the European economy starts to monetize. Now the division of labor is being organized less through these client networks with the church overseeing all of these. And now this is being organized on an individual level with. Um, between individuals. Now all of a sudden the Catholic Church doesn't need to 
organized society because money is doing that, right? What that does is it reduces the pressure against consistency. Now, all of a sudden, we've got this drive, this built-in drive for these two reasons, enforcement and accounting, to buy into groups for their own sake. I'm loyal to my family. I'm loyal to my religion or my ethnic group or whatever. Now, all of a sudden, my family, religion, ethnic group, whatever, doesn't have to be, doesn't have to be inconsistent. Now the Reformation takes off. Now we start getting consistent ethics. And Max Weber noted, where do you see consistent rationalistic ethics? Is in cities where there's money, right? Because that's the only place that rational ethics can survive. And so what we see actually with the rise of the money economy is not immoral immorality like Marx would have it. What we see is more stringent, stricter morality. Um, Nick Baumard has a, a nice paper with yes, uh, a lot I of empirical it. evidence. Yeah, yeah. So you know well, the is one. Is it the one about affluence? affluence yes, you know the one. Yes. A great I paper, right? I read that paper and all of the responses to it. They were all so en en engrossing. I had to read them. Yeah, and it's such a, a great paper because it goes completely against the way we think about money and morality, right? And so in the 20th century, we see fundamentalist revivals in religions everywhere. I mean, fundamentalist Christianity, fundamentalist Islam, you have Hindu nationalism. Uh, none of this would have been possible in a pre-monetary economy. And it's only in the 20th century when the money economy starts to penetrate everywhere in the world that we start to see this premium on religious consistency and you know, moral stringency um, in a way you'd never be able to have before, right? And so in a lot of ways, money intensifies moral feelings rather than, uh, rather than eroding them. Yeah, I agree. And Virg there is Paul Zuck and Virgil Storer, their paper is also really good. Money promotes trust, tolerance, and diversity. Not money, markets. Mm -hmm. And money is a part of markets. But markets are good for us. Yeah, and I think their argument there is sort of that just participating in markets trains us to think in positive sum terms rather than in zero sum terms, which is also yes. true. Yes. So, like, I write for some foreign publications I was born in Jamaica. I'm not there now. I used to write for rare publications, but I no longer do so because, as I said before, I'm not politically correct. So when I back then I was younger and even worse. So when I used to write, I would literally tell people that they're stupid, and the responses were weren't good. But like, I may I'm referring to this point because of the positive sum versus the zero sum argument, and Joe again says that. Necessity is not the mother of invention. Having a zero, having a positive sum of mindset is. Mm -hmm. And if you want to appreciate Jamaican culture, you listen to dance or music because that's the easiest way to gain insight. I don't really listen to it, but if you're walking the public, it's popular, so you're going to hear it. And there is one particular song where in which the entertainer says, I don't trust anybody if they, if we win, they lose. So the zero sum mindset resonates with society. Mm. It's a, it's a lay motif, a recurring theme in dance or music. And policymakers, mm. for whatever reason, maybe they know or maybe they are unable to identify the problem, but they don't seem to be getting the link between low growth rate and Jamaican culture. So. A positive mindset versus a zero sum, zero sum mindset. You're going to start a business. Yeah. People say yes, they're champions. With a positive mindset, they with a zero sum mindset, they find every reason to tell you why you're going to fail. And people can't see the link between mindset and culture in Jamaica. I don't know why. It's just like okay. envy. Like I I like Gersh Gersh Boris Gershman's work on envy. Mm -hmm. Envy deters productivity, and envy again is a recurring lay motif in Jamaican dance hall. They call it bad man and yeah. they laugh because they think it's funny, but it has implications for growth. That's interesting. Uh, in interesting that it shows up so strongly there. Um, 
And this is also why it's so worrying a lot of uh, popular rhetoric now about, you know, millionaires and billionaires. This is why, uh, for example, Bernie is worrying because the mental model in his head and in a lot of people's head is that the more people like Elon Musk and uh, Jeff Bezos have, they're taking it from the rest of us, right? <laughs> Which is completely an anti-growth mindset. And that's going to, if we take that seriously, that's going to return us to that sort of dissipative uh, approach to wealth that is holding back, as you argued, but a lot of we, the African we economies. We may be going back to that era because I follow Joel Mokir and Joel Mokir's findings were replicated in a paper published by Jared Rubin and some other people. Jared was not the co-author, but I can't remember the first author's name. He was a co-author, but not the first author. And the paper is saying that I, the idea of progress correlated with economic growth. And then somebody from the Financial Times ran an analysis and he found that words associated with progress are actually receding in the West. So mm. the, 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 the rhetoric of progress propelled growth. Therefore, the regression of progressive terms could lead to lower growth. It could diminish growth. So that's quite concerning. For sure. And yeah, I, I think this is um this was McCloskey's point. Yes, that, we draw dignity. Exactly, right? That you have these new moral ideas. And you know, there's also the argument there that this is, you know, completely different from all these other arguments, which I don't necessarily buy. But I think the point that this is a moral phenomenon. I, I think that's an important point. Yes, because we there's this economist is interested in economics, the I in the idea of economics. Mm -hmm. He's maybe maybe he's of German descent. I've read some of his papers, and he has a paper contending that the concept of an economist being future oriented is a European invention. And that corresponded with the intellectual and economic revolution in the West. So before Westerners became wealthy, they were also becoming more future oriented. He's an economist, but he but these studies are theoretical. I'm yet to see a quantitative study, but so far I'm buying the argument because the speculative evidence seems to be plausible. And by future oriented, uh, going back to your previous point, yeah. you mean not oriented toward uh, dissipating things in kin networks. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So future oriented, thinking about the future, planning, rational business models. So right. <laughs> yeah, I some people for whatever reason tend to negate the argument that the West changed culturally before it became wealthy. But this evidence is becoming overwhelming. Before the great divergence in wealth, the West was culturally a different place. That's why it could diverge from the rest. Yeah, and so you're connecting here, you're connecting very directly to um, Henrich's marriage and family program yeah. in breaking down these kin networks. And Joel Monk here, he's writing a new book. And mm -hmm. this book will focus more broadly on individual demand other cultural factors that lead to growth. I read one of the working papers that may be a chapter in the book. He mm -hmm. co-authored that paper with Tabellini. It's, it's a book published that will be published by Tabellini and Mokir. But look, time is wrapping up, so we have to end, unfortunately. But just Sounds been a good. really engaging conversation. Absolutely, and thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. Yes, bye, yes. Bye, Cameron. Have a great evening. You too.